We now are at the end of Nintendo Power's seventh year for Nintendo Power number 72 for May of 1995. We don't have a lot of games this issue, like about six ish, but we do, well, seven, maybe eight. But we do have the results of this year's Nintendo Power Awards, so let's get started. Our cover game for this issue is Kirby's Dream Land 2 for the Game Boy. Of course, the art on the cover is pretty bland and generic and doesn't get much crossed about the game aside from Kirby's Animal Companions. In the latest column of this issue, we have some praise for the RPG column, which I echo. In the power charts, the Super Nintendo poll has Kirby's Dream Course entering the rankings, but no new games entering the poll on the Game Boy. That may change next issue. Our themed top 10 for this issue is Epics, which is predominated uh, dominated by Super Nintendo role-playing games, with the exception of Link's Awakening on the Game Boy, which isn't that much of a surprise. We get our first two Super Nintendo games, really, in the Hall of Fame, uh, with Pilot Rings and F-Zero. We'll start off this issue with the first of three fighting games to get coverage, and the first of two that will actually get reviewed, Justice League Task Force. The article gives a rundown on the game's roster, which is mostly heroes with a smattering of villains, which includes, oddly enough, Darkseid. He feels like a character who I would make the game's very final boss, and someone who is not playable without cheat, in any mode, unless you're going one step higher for your um, utterly broken boss character, like, oh, the Monitor. Much as Blizzard's earlier DC game, Death of Superman, was a fairly good brawler that was designed exclusively for consoles, but still had some arcade issues, um, particularly coming, considering it was coming from a Western developer, Justice League Task Force is a pretty good fighting game. The controls are pretty solid, and while my performance in this footage isn't great, with each fight here I have a sense of, as I lose, what more or less I'm doing wrong. Blizzard even has the sense to borrow archetypes and move ideas from other fighting games and give them some tweaks to get them balanced. For example, Green Arrow has reused fireball attack. It's used it's a quarter circle plus a punch to fire the bow, with some tweaks to give them to give the balance being in terms of you, depending on which strength punch you hit, and it uses all six buttons, um, will determine how fast or how slow the arrow takes to come out. A heavy punch will take longer to draw the arrow than a light punch. Similarly, Superman has Sub-Zero's freeze attack with his ice breath, but here it's done as a sort of close-range sustained attack, like uh, E-Honda's Hundred Hand Slap. It's novel, it's actually something which I wouldn't mind seeing on a side stage at EVO, if somebody were to do Super EVO or something like that, where it's like the Marvel fighting games and all, and all of the DC fighting games, including this one. Um, would I put this up there with SNKs or Capcom's Best? No. Is it an underrated gem that's worth your time? Absolutely. Do I kind of wish that rather than going into MOBAs and like in addition to MOBAs and hero shooters and that sort of thing, would I love to see, well, Blizzard try their hand at a fighting game again? You betcha. The second fighting game we'll be reviewing this issue is Fatal Fury Special, a dream match game characters from the first two titles. The article gives some information on the mechanical improvements, like the reintroduction of combo attacks from the arcade version, along with the expanded roster. Fatal Fury Special is the Fatal Fury series' best showing on consoles. It's... Not as close as the Super Nintendo can get to an arcade-perfect Fatal Fury game, or graphically anyway, but it's pretty close mechanically. Um, for graphics, you gotta go to the Neo Geo for that, obviously. Um, the fact that this game has Dolby surround sound as an option to, in this game also helps a lot, particularly in these days where we're all looking for ways to play our old console games on our new HDTVs with sound bars and high-definition sound systems. Um, because, hey, you put this in a console that supports HDMI, like the Super NT, you run it through your sound system receiver, and that's a, that's some good listening. Our final fighting game of the issue is a preview of a game that isn't out yet. Mortal Kombat 3. While the Super Nintendo version is not out, the game is out in arcades, so we get an in-depth on the development of the arcade version, along with a description of the game's story. We now come to our cover game, and the first Game Boy game of the issue, of two, and Kirby's second outing on the Game Boy, and the first game to choose the mechanic of Kirby having animal friends with Kirby's Dream Land 2. The article gives a pretty complete map of the game's levels, along with a rundown of your three 
different animal friends you can get over the course of the game. Kirby's Dream Land 2 is kind of a slight hybrid of these Super Nintendo and Nintendo Kirby games, and all the earlier Game Boy title. Kirby's Animal Companions provide a lighter form of the power theft mechanic that's used in the console games, but was not present in its Kirby's previous Game Boy outing. But without going into the same range of options when it comes to stealing power, where you can yank special abilities from anyone who has one. It's still a solid Kirby game, with level design that works incredibly well on the Game Boy, and it helps with the game support saves, making it much more conductive for play in car rides and in waiting rooms, and or on the bus, or what, what have you. In the news in Epic Center, Dragon Quest VI has been expanded to a 32 meg cart, and might even get shown at E3, although this version of the game does not get a US release. Further, Seventh Saga 2 is in development, while Koei is working on sequels to Pacific Theater of Operations and Brandish. Speaking of which, um, this section has expanded coverage on two games I've covered already, um, both from Koei, uh, King Arthur and the Knights of Justice, and, well, Brandish, along with some strategies for Breath of Fire. Well, the votes have been tabulated and the results are in for the Nintendo Power Award, so here's how they shaped out. Donkey Kong Country had a really great outing, taking home best graphics and sound, theme and fun, and play control for the Super Nintendo, along with best hero, best baddie, and best overall. The Game Boy Donkey Kong game also took home best graphics and sound and challenge for the Game Boy. Final Fantasy III took home a few rewards for best challenge for the Super Nintendo, best epic, best villain, which is not surprising, best goodie, Coolest weapon and armor, best setting and story, also not surprising, and coolest transportation. Mortal Kombat 2 took home best tournament fighter for the console version, and the Game Boy version took home best play control on the Game Boy. NBA Jam took home awards for best sports game and best multiplayer game. Finally, among the wall one-offs, Earthworm Jim took home best original character, Wario Land took home best theme and fun for the Game Boy, and finally, Super Metroid was absolutely robbed, placing second to and basically every category that Donkey Kong Country run won, with the exception of a couple categories that Final Fantasy III placed second in, and only actually winning best move for the Crystal Flash. Getting back to game coverage, um, we have True Lies for the Super Nintendo based on the James Cameron film. The movie has been adapted into something of a top-down shooter, and is published by LJN. The article has maps and notes for much of the game. True Lies is an interesting game, one that, given unlimited lives and some sort of checkpoint system, would basically be a modern game on a 16-bit console. Um, the game has a series of levels and modeled events of the film, with you playing as Arnie's character, and for most shooters, each level has a mix of hostile and civilian targets, so you are penalized for killing civilians, so you can't just rock and roll with a machine gun like in Contra. Now, this is also combined with controls that have a dedicated strafe button and a dodge roll, so you ha it's actually a fairly tactical degree of movement here. It's not using the uh, face buttons for uh, eight-way shooting like with Smash TV. It's requiring you to carefully use cover and that sort of thing to maneuver around environments. The idea being is you'd lock off your movement in a particular facing and dodge back and forth behind some form of cover to take on a particularly difficult target and use the roll button to move through areas where there's enemies that lots of enemies shooting. So, like, it feels like if I made this game polygonal and had a lock on where you could, or could select a target to actually lock on to, this would basically be siphon filter. But with limited lives and no lock on, it's not quite there. Continuing with movie licensed games, we have The Flintstones, based on the John Goodman film. Here's the thing about The Flintstones. By this point, we've had several pretty good caveman-themed platformers, including a few decent Flintstone games. There is actually no excuse for a caveman platformer, and especially a Flintstones game, as bad as this game is, and yet this game is this bad, and I blame Ocean for it. Ocean has had a track record on the Super Nintendo as long and as far as Acclaim and even LJN. They should, at this point, are experienced with the platform. They have also put out some decent games. The Adams Family game from last episode 
was pretty good. So, there's no excuse for this game being this bad, unless, for some reason, this is a case where, basically, they are just churning these out, just rushing them. And they're not willing to give these titles the time and the staff that is required to do them well. So I don't know if this is a situation where, I don't know, um, they don't care or they are just straight up rushing for this position, uh, rushing these games. But either way, there's no real like legitimate excuse for this. They can do better. They should do better or, or should have done better. Speaking of better games, in the Classroom Information column, we get information on how to get to the Dragon Punch in Mega Man X2. In our next feature article, we learn that online gaming has come to the Super Nintendo with the X-Band modem. There have been previous versions for the Genesis, but now the Super Nintendo has one too. We get some basic information on the technology behind the advice, or device, I should say, though there isn't much information on how matchmaking works, or how they produce latency, or anything else like that. The last of our movie licensed games this issue is Warlock, though going by the description, it's based on the second film in the series, not the first. Warlock is something of a mess of a game. Graphically, it's interesting with some nice parallax scrolling, with music and visual design that build up a good sense of uh, eeriness, and with the enemy design, particularly in the first few levels, also working well as all, with with having mundane people in the environments transformed into monsters by the titular warlock. Um, it actually makes me want to pick up the uh, first couple movies to see how those hold up. However, the actual combat in this game is incredibly clunky, making enemies very hard to deal with and leading to a lot of cheap hits making playing the game a chore. On top of all of that, Warlock has the problem, as a lot of LJN movie licensed games do, of giving you only one life and no continues. It makes for a game that's an unpleasant, clunky mess. There is, going from game packs, a straight-up invulnerability code in the game, but still, not great. Our final Super Nintendo game of the issue is Porky Pig's Haunted Holiday, our first Looney Tunes game with Porky as protagonist and with notes on the first three stages. Porky Pig's Haunted Holiday is visually impressive, with interesting sprite designs and large and expansive levels, but I'm not sure what's going tonally. The music is actually creepy and haunting, while the enemy designs tend towards the somewhat goofy. The levels call for pulling off some incredibly involved platforming, while the controls and animations aren't quite precise enough to perform that platforming well. Though some reviews at the time described the game as being too easy. I don't know about that. Mechanically, the game wants to be like the platforming sequences from Legend of the Mystical Ninja, mixing the macabre and gruesome with the comedic, but it's not quite rigorous enough in its design to pull that off, and that's actually kind of a bummer. In Counselor's Corner, we get some questions about Wizardry 5 on the Super Nintendo. The internet is becoming a thing. At least in the 90s. It's a thing now. It's not a thing when this issue came out, but it's becoming one. Which means Nintendo Power is going to have a web presence. And so they get information on their plans for MSN and AOL with their own AOL keyword, even, with a regular website to come later. Our final game of the issue is PGA European Tour, a golf game on the Game Boy with some basic notes on each of the four courses. So I'm going to say my gameplay footage for this game isn't great, and my performance isn't great as the emulator I'm using for gameplay capture had some very serious issues with the game's interface, particularly the lower third, for some reason. That said, given the clear issues I'm running into here, I was generally able to do okay at the game, hitting par a lot. That said, the issues with the HUD did me dirt when it came to adjusting for wind conditions, as I wasn't able to do the things that you normally do for when you have big crosswinds and that sort of thing, or with dog legs and some holes and go for a hook or a slice. But it polarized it plays fairly well. In the now playing column, among the also rans is Godzilla Destroy All Monsters, a kaiju fighting game, Power Instinct, another fighting game, Power Drive, or racing game, and The Shadow, a brawler based on the film starring Alec Baldwin. Finally, in Pack Watch, Doom 
is coming to the Super Nintendo. That is, the id Software game Doom, not like the Doom that came to Sarnath. Although Sarnath maybe also got a copy of Doom. I, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been to Sarnath. Um, anyway, we're also getting Syndicate as well, and the Super Nintendo port of Rondo of Blood, Castlevania Dracula X. Two is Kirby's Dream Land 2. It is this rock-solid Game Boy game. It is certainly one of the best titles for that system. Um, a lot of the best titles for that system are Nintendo First Party. And it's a very solid Kirby game, with a close second being Fatal Fury Special. It is a solid game. There are it's gotten re-releases um, of the both the arcade and the Neo Geo version on uh, numerous platforms. Uh, Xbox 360 as through Xbox Live Arcade. I believe it's gotten included in a couple Fatal Fury archives um, collections for the PS2, and it rec most recently got a, a release on to the uh, Hamsters Arcade Archives collection on. I want to say all the platform, all the, the current platforms, Switch, PS4, Xbox One, that sort of thing. So you can get it with much better graphics than the Super Nintendo version. But if you don't have those consoles or you're looking for a really, really solid fighting game to play on your Super Nintendo, it's a good game to go with. Justice League Task, Fo Task Force, I'd also give some serious consideration to. Um, if you've already got Fatal Fury Special or you've picked up the more modern version and want something that is distinct and unique to the Super Nintendo, that is a good option as well. Next time, we begin the best of the rest for Nintendo Power 7th year, and we'll see how many episodes that's going to entail by then when I've had a chance to put the list together. Catch you next time. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any f future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. <laughs>